On today's World Inside, daily talks between Russia and Ukraine in earnest efforts to end the conflict. What are the prospects of a breakthrough in the negotiations? And the power of architecture to breathe new life in resource-challenged communities. As seen in the work of this year's Pritzker Prize awardee, the Abedo Francis Kere, an exclusive talk about his design philosophy. I want to say beauty is the right for everyone, you know. We deserve, we des everyone deserves quality and beauty. Here's our host, Tian Wei. I'm Tian Wei, and this is World Insight on CTTN. We begin with the ongoing Ukraine crisis. Another round of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine took place Monday via video link. The head of the Russian delegation said the negotiations are being held daily. The Ukraine conflict was in the agenda on the meeting between Chinese senior diplomat Yang Jiechi and U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in Rome on Monday. Yang elaborated on China's position, calling on the international community to support the Russia-Ukraine peace talks to achieve substantive results as soon as possible. Meanwhile, NATO defense ministers will meet on Wednesday to discuss Ukraine. Earlier, Russia's Sputnik quoted the Ukrainian president advisor as saying a Russia-Ukraine peace agreement could be reached within one to two weeks. So, how far are the talks from a breakthrough? What can we expect in the coming days? Let's loop in our panelists. On the latest uh, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, joining us in Wyoming, Robert Ross, an associate of Harvard University, John King Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. In Washington, D.C., Anton Fidashian, a professor of history at the American University. Last but not least, in Shanghai, Zhao Long, a professor of the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies from Shanghai Institutes for International Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, Mr. Ross, I usually talk to you about China the U.S. relations. Of course, we would touch on that because of the latest uh, discussion between Sullivan and Young. Now, both sides put out long readouts without giving very specifics about how they touch on the issue of a Russia-Ukraine crisis. From your perspective, uh, what is the expectation uh, from Washington and meanwhile the background, the play uh, or role that Washington has been playing in the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Well, I think on the U.S.-China front, the United States does not expect full Chinese compliance with American sanctions or even European sanctions, but is looking for extensive restraint so as not to make it easy for Russia. And of course, that would include no arms sales, no getting around the banking sanctions, and of course, no transfer of high technologies. And of course, this is a turning point, a potential turning point in mm. U.S.-China relations, because should China help its strategic partner in avoiding American sanctions, the European sanctions, China would be aligning itself with Russia against Europe. Mm. And so whatever this deterioration of U.S.-Russian relations would also lead to a significant deterioration of U.S.-China relations. All right. That would lead to a polarization. Okay. So this is a turning point for China and the United States. Would that also be uh, concerns from China as yes. well, uh, Mr. Zhao, uh, in Shanghai, about the background role that the U.S. has been playing regarding the Russia-Ukraine crisis? I think uh, China's position is quite clear. Uh, China is calling for the maximum restraint, which concerns all parties to this conflict. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it means to continue effort to construction of humanitarian corridors. On the other hand, uh, to create a, a favorable uh, environment for continued peace negotiations and to help de-escalate the situation. Mm -hmm. With regard to U.S., I think there's a uh, uh, our uh, design for the U.S. Uh, to call for the U.S. to uh, to lower the tensions and to uh, may maybe to make some steps to stop uh, the continued supply of weapons mm. to the uh, Ukraine side and to lead the very concrete and productive uh, negotiation process and also not to expanding 
the unilateral sanctions outside the UN uh, framework. I think okay. th this is, uh, will be the China's position towards the negotiation and right. towards the United States. After all, this is not necessarily a conflict directly involving China and the United States. The key parties are Russia and Ukraine. So that's why I go to Professor Fidashian. You've been watching and observing as well as researching about Russia and Ukraine over the past decades. Tell me more about how serious are they from your assessment about a peace deal and how soon it could be? <laughs> Um, it's difficult to say a uh, way about the seriousness. The uh, Ukrainians are actually speaking in terms of weeks um, and even months um, uh, in some cases. Zayemsky's uh, former spokeswoman was actually on your channel a little bit earlier mm -hmm. today, uh, speaking of a potential deal maybe in uh, May. So it looks like both sides have uh, dug in. And despite the catastrophe that the conflict is visiting on the people of uh, Ukraine, um, I don't really see either side really moving towards a, um, uh, a quick solution. Now, having said that, I think it's important to, for everyone to remember that what we as outsiders see and hear publicly about the talks is really only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the bulk Very of true. diplomatic uh, negotiations mm. always happen behind closed doors. Most of them are secret, as they should be, because there are always questions that are discussed that could be politically damaging to all sides. Mm. The Russians have drawn red lines in the sand. It is almost impossible, for example, for the Kremlin, for Putin, to give up some of the most important uh, demands that the Russians had put forward about three months ago yeah. without losing uh, face. And for the Ukrainians, it will be very difficult to simply give in to these demands. I imagine that one of the things that may be discussed right now behind closed doors are a form of reparations, of payment by the Russians for the recognition of Crimea, for the potential recognition by the Ukrainian side of the independence of the Donetsk and Lugansk people's right. republics. Mm -hmm. If Ukraine agrees to this, it may come down to money and sort of a face-saving move away from the precipice. Mm. Mr. Zhao, you've been also researching about Russia for a very long time. Uh, tell me your assessment. Of course, uh, Ukraine also a very important uh, a party in this uh, two-party uh, discussion. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, the West support for Ukraine at this point? Uh, I'm not talking about humanitarian issues because everybody uh, is talking about humanitarian issues, but rather the West support militarily to Ukraine, how much will it hold on? And how do you see the peace negotiations taking place in parallel with the military conflicts? Well, of course, the West support, especially the military support to the Ukraine will be seen as the, the measure of uh, escalation of situation to uh, Russia. So I think, uh, of course, there are still hope for the ceasefire by taking some diplomatic efforts. But uh, there is uh, still quite a long way to go yeah. before uh, to reach that uh, final uh, ceasefire. Uh, because I think the willingness of uh, both sides to compromise is not particularly very strong until there is a, a clear winner in this fight, in the battlefield. Mm. So in general, the end of this conflict still depends on Russia's political will especially on the, its assessment of the cost of this uh, military operation, of its uh, self-assessment of uh, completion of uh, uh, its strategic objectives and mm. etc. And the most important thing, I think, this the conflict is ostensibly between Russia and the Ukraine, but it's actually a grand uh, contest or competition between Russia and the West so the situation also depends on the United States and NATO's position and approach. Of course, all the parties are moving very quickly. It is a, a struggling of priorities, one could argue, Ross, uh, Mr. Ross, about uh, uh, Washington right now. You know, there's uh, the 
uh, nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula. There is the Iran peace deal. And of course, there's something happening between Russia and the Ukraine. We see this administration struggling with priorities while trying to emphasize its uh, emphasis on Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Rouse, how do you see, you know, the U.S. Uh, functioning of, uh, of, of a player right now, and particularly, you know, its danger of portraying China uh, the way that they portrayed the Russia for decades, and which leaves possibly very little maneuvering place for the decision makers in the future regarding China policy. Well, the relationship between the United States and China is heavily involved in the Ukraine situation. Now, Professor Zhao has done much work on, on Russia, and he understands it well. But his concern for fairness or American arms sales, we understand that if America didn't s send arms to the Ukraine, the Russians would walk all over Ukraine. And maybe that's what China wants, maybe would like to see a Russian victory. But in the issue I'm of fairness I'm not sure whether that assumption of, is of very Ukraine accurate, sir. I think American in We are staying here I mainly not about assumptions, uh, but rather about, about power, discussions Russia based on facts. I hope you don't use assumptions to, as evidence to back your argument. Yes, the facts are, the facts are is the Russian army is outside Kyiv, and without arms helping, helping Ukraine, they'd already be in Kyiv. I think you can agree with that. So I would think if you did, wanted to see Ukraine's sovereignty upheld, you might want to support the United States in doing what it's doing. Mm. Now, yes, the United States is very concerned about East Asia, very concerned about pivoting to East Asia. But how we conduct our relationship with, East, with China within East Asia is going to a considerable degree depend on how China responds to the situation in Ukraine. All right. And we expect Let the Chinese, at best, to not help the, the Russians defeat Ukraine. All right. Let me, let me also go to Mr. Zhao, just to so, be fair, going further, uh, because United we only have a very little time left. How much time do we have for this round of discussion? 30 seconds, maybe. So, Mr. Zhao, very briefly, can you respond to Mr. Ross, just to be fair? And you only have about 30 seconds. Well, I think China is obviously not helping uh, Russia to win the war or to win this uh, military conflict. China's attitude to playing a mediating role remain open, but uh, it depends on some factors. It will be unproductive approach to China when, uh, on one hand, asking China to do something uh, to mediate uh, while increasing the sanctions, even threatening to sanction on Chinese companies that cooperate with Russia. I think it will be unfair for uh, China to uh, make such uh, some mm. positive uh, approach or effort in, in this crisis. Okay, can, can we still have 30 seconds more? Uh, because Mr. Fidashian also need to have an opportunity. Uh, Mr. Can we do that? 30 seconds. Okay, Mr. Fidashian, please. 30 seconds. I think the, uh, the Russian position uh, has been to hope that the Chinese will support the Russian economy. I don't think I haven't heard or read about anyone in their right mind expecting the Chinese to come in uh, on the military side of this conflict, but really to, uh, to stay out. But whether this will actually work in what has um, become a, a war of economic attrition between Russia and the West right. uh, is an open-ended question. All right, we are wrapping up today's discussion. I want to thank the three of you for expressing your opinions. Limited time for a very important discussion that will continue in the next few episodes of our program in the future. Appreciate it. Robert Ross, Anton Fidashian, Zhao Long. Thank you, gentlemen. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tianwei. Coming up in the program, the power of architecture to breathe new life in resource-challenged communities as seen in the work of this year's Pritzker Prize awardee. An exclusive talk about this. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. A well-regarded architecture award, the Pritzker Prize, announced the 2022 honoree on Tuesday. The Pritzker is always awarded to architects whose work, quote, has produced consistent and significant contributions to humanity through the art of architecture. This year, Dei Beidou Francis Kele, I hope I pronounced his name right, a talented architect who was born and raised in Western Africa, received the Pritzker Prize. He is known for architecture that empowers and transforms 
communities, especially contemporary school institutions, health facilities, civic buildings, and public spaces in infrastructure-hungry developing countries. Mr. Kire is well known for the smart use of local materials to suit the nature climate. His well-known work in his hometown, the Gando Primary School, is a testament to his architectural skills and philosophy. He believes people have the right to enjoy quality, comfort living, even in the developing countries, and particularly in the developing countries. In an exclusive interview with me earlier, he talked about the concepts behind the design. Great. Francis, what a pleasure to see you. Yeah, no, I am very, very honored. I'm happy to be able to speak to you on this great occasion. You know, I was reading through the materials uh, sent by your friends to me, and it was just amazing how you managed to build so many things, schools, house facilities, museums, you know, parliamentary buildings, and also, you know, for the, uh, the, fe the outdoor festivals, everything. How did you manage to do that? Where does the, all these inspiration come from? <laughs> it's a passion and a love for design. It's the passion and the love to create space that will inspire people, that will give people chance to celebrate themselves, to stay in intimacy, to be with their friends, to be with their family. It is this love like the you know that is pushing me to create what i'm doing i i totally believe in that because without that there's no real drive but you know you've been building so many things including uh, you know very low budget school for yeah. uh, developing countries particularly mm -hmm. in your home country and home continent africa so what mm -hmm. is the the architecture with the lowest budget you ever built <laughs> um <laughs> no it, it's Actually, it is my very first school, the school that I built in my, my home village. Um, there was, let me say, honestly, there was no budget, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I yeah, thought you, you know, were gonna say 1,000 or 2,000 dollars, but, but there's yeah. zero that budget. Yeah, oh, yeah. And then, but I had to create the foundation to find uh, people that will donate me the little money that I needed to buy the material and to, uh, you know, <laughs> All the work came from the community. You know, I had to convince everyone to support build the school. And that it happened, it happened. And is so making my people today very proud, you know, very proud. I saw the photo of that school, very unique. And it builds beautifully with, uh, you know, the, the surroundings and the lighting of the day, uh, and also yeah. the colors being combined as well as the local, materials. Uh, tell yeah. me more about how you came up with that idea. How did it work eventually? Yeah, um, we have to say that it's uh, very hot. So in my home uh, country, really, mm. it can be very hot. And at the same time, people are really curious, enthusiastic for new things. And that is another aspect that is important to highlight. Uh, people being using clay like for to build their houses for generations but you know nowadays people consider clay to be poor people material so first of, of all i needed to improve the quality of clay you know just putting a little bit of cement and making bricks that look so regular through uh, compression you know you built after the school, which is your first building, you said, uh, you also yeah. built so many other things, like we said earlier, you know, uh, hospitals, uh, parliamentary buildings, and you're building around the world now. But you said famously one thing, which I think really needs to be noted in this interview. You said, it's not because you are rich that you should waste the materials. It is not because you are poor that you should not try to create quality. I love that. Uh, totally. I don't believe so. I think that we have the potential to make the best out of every challenge that we have and we're facing, you know. And for me, it's, you know, I would want to say beauty is the right 
for everyone you know we deserve we des everyone deserve quality and beauty and that's what i try to do with my project generally when i started to build building a school in africa was considered like something like ah oh, yeah they just need basic it's basic thing yeah and so i i didn't accept it i want i didn't want to accept it i wanted to create the best for my people and so i started to source material to source way and design how within the budget the given the very let me say again non-existing budget how i could create the building like this so that people has great comfort you know mm -hmm. that that lightning system is wonderful using the element and ventilation true passive element true design element and so create a place where the kids are really happy to stay in and where mm -hmm. teaching is easy and comfort for everyone you know yeah. the materials that you use as an architect very yeah. much indicate the ideas that you have about our world and the nature so how do yeah. you see we can combine you know the qualities of these materials with uh, some of the more most uh, natural born materials at different yeah. places around the world mm -hmm. no i mean it, this is a fact um innovation and industry is great industrialization is great for our future but it's also we have to know that they brought things that are causing a big burden i'm thinking about plastic and certain other materials that now has become part of our concern mm, i think the future of architecture will be um, how we combine all these elements with natural resources to create space for people we building will still be needed tomorrow but that is how we balance all of these together that yeah, is why because, yeah. because you yourself I, I mean you grew up uh, on the african continent in Burkina Faso right if i remember yes. right and yeah. also you yourself experienced the days when you don't have enough lighting when you are in a very poorly uh, furnished or built uh, classroom uh, when you were a student there. So you know yeah. exactly what the student wanted and how to achieve it. You put your heart in it, it seems. Exactly, exactly. In my, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I had to leave my family when I was seven to go to a, 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 a city um, 20 kilometers far to attend education, but 20 kilometer doesn't sound like uh, far. Mm -hmm. But imagine there is even no, at that time, no bike. The only one holding bicycle, you could count them. There was only a few people in my village owning bicycle, you know? So if you think about transportation and you see that the only, the only means of transportation is a, a bicycle owned by a few people, and then there is a donkey, you know, then you, you, you understand, you understand how far 20 kilometer may be, you know. And so I went there to attend school and then I was, it revolted me to see that you, outside there was a sunlight so bright, but inside you couldn't, be, you could barely read because there was no light, you know. It was like tiny little openings and also it was hot inside. And, you know, in my head, let me say, I was growing the idea to make things better one day when I become adult. You know, that is very simple. And so to create better classrooms for kids and, and even more to, to do better architecture. Now, that is how it started. Yeah. And today, of course, you are a very accomplished architect. And also you're winning this year's uh, Prisker Prize. Congratulations. You've been built so many <sighs> things on the African continent, including that parliamentary building. People are proud of you, you know, being uh, from where they are. Uh, but, you know, you're not only working in that direction, but also mm -hmm. serving the world. You know, building architectures around the world is something coming from within, where you originally coming from. So that is another direction, but totally fascinating journey as well. Tell me more about that. Today, I am like, wow, uh, overwhelmed because of uh, the Prisca Prize, you know it. And I honestly need to agree that I never, 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 even in my 
fantasy full dream, uh, dream about being connected to the Prisca Foundation. And now it's done. You know, I am deeply connected with it because as you know, I am laureate. And so, um, but if, if I'm like taking my time to really be myself, I will tell you doing the projects always for me is like, wow, I want to fascinate people. I want to inspire people through my architecture. I want to take, take elements from my culture, you know, to bring it to places where I think it is needed, you know, to show, to show, you know, the abundance of fantasy, you know, and imagination from my culture. Like if I do a project in the US, I will do everything so that people know this continent has more to deliver than misery, you know, mm -hmm. and that is what I'm trying to bring. And then also I'm trying to be, um, to be careful with material, you know, um, I think everywhere in the world, we need quality as a, you know, as a site. Um, and that I'm trying to really think about elements like the environment also, uh, mm -hmm. because we, it is a big concern. And that's what I'm trying to also introduce into yeah. my architecture. Francis, congratulations on winning the Prisca Award. Certainly a very renowned award in the world of architecture. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Inside. Check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.